the U of C and uh, so many of our other institutions. Thank you all for coming and participating, uh, as well as to uh, Bow Valley President Laura Jo Gunter. Thank you for, for coming uh, as well. So I want to start just by providing a little bit of context. Uh, as, as you may know, the government of Alberta invests over $2 billion annually into post-secondary education. And this is done by providing operational funding to 26 universities, colleges, and polytechnics across the province through the Campus Alberta Grant. The current model of investing in post-secondary education is not working in the best possible way. Government funding is not tied to the achievement of any targets, progress towards goals, or to the changing economic and labor demands. The McKinnon panel report made a very similar recommendation and, and made a very similar conclusion. They noted in their report, quote, that the current funding structure does not link funding to the achievement of specific goals or priorities for the province, such as ensuring the required skills for the current and future labor market. Furthermore, today's difficult economic times demands that government be a good steward of taxpayer dollars. However, despite these challenging financial times, I firmly believe that with bold action, innovative thinking and transformative change, we can build a stronger post-secondary system. A stronger post-secondary system that ensures young Albertans can find rewarding careers. A stronger system ensures taxpayer dollars are being used to support teaching and research instead of growing administration and among other things, a stronger system ensures we are proactive in training the workforce of tomorrow. To help achieve this, I am proud to announce today a total transformation in government funding to our post-secondary institutions. In a single sentence, this new model is designed to help our students succeed. Beginning April 1st, the government of Alberta will move to a performance-based funding model. Performance-based funding is not something new and is a developing and growing trend in higher education. Approximately 35 US states use a form of performance-based funding over the last 10 years. And many other countries around the world, including the United Kingdom, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Norway, Denmark, and Hong Kong, just to name a few, also use performance-based funding in higher education. In 2018, the OECD produced a report on Norway's performance-based model. And as part of their analysis on the need to improve higher education system performance, they concluded that there are opportunities to expand work-integrated learning, and improve career guidance to improve labor market relevance of graduates. A similar study recently in June 2019 by the Australian government conducted uh, on performance-based funding issued a series of recommendations. And those recommendations called for the creation of a performance-based funding model to create more accountability for taxpayers and to ensure that graduate outcomes are a priority. So as you can see, policymakers and leaders around the world are taking a close look at the relationship between government funding and labor market outcomes of post-secondary institutions, and we must do the same to remain competitive. So let me walk you through what this new funding, funding model will look like and some of the other nuances and details of it. So firstly, it's important to note that this model will be non-competitive. So this means that institutions will not compete against each other for taxpayer dollars. Rather, they will compete against themselves and seek to improve their own performance against a series of targets. Secondly, uh, the amount of funding tied to performance outcomes will begin at 15% for 2020-2021 and gradually increase over three years to a maximum of 40% by 22, 23. Thirdly, the government will evaluate performance against a maximum of approximately 20 specific key indicators. 
the key performance indicators will be gradually introduced over the next three years to ensure that we use the best possible metrics that have rigorous and verifiable data sources. Officials from my department will begin con consulting with our post-secondary community to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to discuss the indicators and, of course, to suggest new ones as well. And with that in mind, there are indeed several indicators that government would like to see, which include graduation and completion rates, graduate employment, experiential learning, enrollment, both domestic and international, commercialization of IP, research capacity, quality of teaching, and student experience and student satisfaction. These are just some examples of key performance indicators that may be used to establish targets and that institutions will have to reach in order to obtain full funding. It is also critically important to me that our students and each institution themselves have the ability to identify key performance indicators that are most important to them, which is why each group, both students and our institutions themselves, will have the ability to define a key performance indicator of their own. Fourthly, key performance indicators will also be weighted differently depending on the institution. So for example, a university's highest weighting may be on achieving targets related to medical research, whereas a college's heaviest weighting may be on growing the number of domestic students. It's important to recognize this because each one of our post-secondary institutions is unique, and it's important that we work with, with them to develop targets that meet their individual mandates and priorities. Institutions that meet all of their targets will receive 100% of allotted funding. And if an institution does not meet their targets, it will still receive a portion of funding that's allocated proportionate to the level of achievement. So I'll give you an example. If the U of A has a target to produce 5% more tech grads, but only achieves 80% of that goal, they would receive 80% of allotted funding for that metric. Now, to implement this new performance-based funding model, I'm proud to announce a second significant transformation in the nature of the relationship between government and our universities and colleges. Currently, government renews its relationship with post-secondary institutions on an annual basis, through, primarily through the disbursement of the Campus Alberta grant and through the collection of annual reports. However, in order for us to build a stronger system, we must reduce administrative burden, cut red tape, and leave our institutions free to innovate and compete. Changing course every year does not allow our institutions the flexibility and freedom that they need to improve and reach their targets. With that being said, I'm proud to announce the creation of investment management agreements, which will be three years in duration. Again, this is a model that exists around the world, including Austria, Ireland, and Finland. And in Hong Kong as well, university accountability agreements are signed with publicly funded institutions every three years. Creating investment management agreements will have multiple benefits. Firstly, it'll reduce red tape for our institutions. Currently, our institutions provide to government a annual report, a mandate statement, and comprehensive institutional plans. With these new investment management agreements, other reports, some reports will be completely eliminated so that our universities can spend less time sending reports to government and spend more time researching new breakthroughs and helping young Albertans find rewarding careers. Secondly, these three-year investment management agreements will provide, finally, greater long-term funding predictability. While, indeed, a portion of funding will be at risk, the majority of funding will not be. And under a three-year investment management agreement, an institution will have a much better sense of how much they can expect to receive from government over that three-year period. I'm proud to be able to achieve these important transformations. Our government does not believe in simply kicking the can down the road. 
We are ready and willing to make transformative change that our province needs, and we know that we will emerge stronger as a result. I believe that an outcomes-based funding model will both lead to better outcomes and increase confidence in the post-secondary system. It'll help sharpen the system's focus and direct efforts towards ensuring students succeed in the labor market and provide job creators the talent that they need to drive our economy forward. The new funding approach will ensure our universities, colleges, and polytechnics are both efficient and innovative. It'll make sure institutions remain accountable for the investment that taxpayers make in them, and it'll provide more clarity to taxpayers on exactly what funding is meant to accomplish. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take your questions. Will uh, an advisory uh, committee or panel be assigned to this uh, uh, performance-based uh, funding program? So we will, uh, through the investment management agreements, we will sit down with each individual institution and uh, negotiate the conditions of the, of the agreements and discuss the weighting and the specific metrics to be used. And so government and each institution at this time will work together to ensure accountability of that system. When do you expect to set the criteria for each school of, of what their performance-based measures are? So we will begin immediately consultation uh, with, um, with our post-secondary stakeholders, our institutions, faculty, and students, so that we can uh, establish that. We do intend to have the new system up and running uh, for April 1st uh, for the new fiscal year of our institutions, or many of our institutions. Uh, so within the next uh, couple months, we aim to have all of those, uh, those metrics and weighting defined. So you said that institutions are going to have the opportunity to create at least one indicator that Correct. is their, theirs personally, theirs their own, Correct. and would not exist at other institutions potentially? Correct. Yes, that's absolutely correct. But other than that, other than that one indicator, how, you said you'll be engaging with them, but how much of a voice do they have in terms of uh, actually finding those other universal indicators? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have the system-wide metrics that will be quite, you know, universal to all, uh, all the system and to all institutions. And again, they may be weighted differently for each, each institution, uh, but they will be system-wide. And they'll, they'll have an incredible voice. It's important for us to ensure that, again, our students, our faculty, and our uh, universities have the opportunity to review some of these metrics that we are, as government are thinking of, provide commentary, provide feedback, and I'm, as I mentioned as well, to even provide uh, other metrics, perhaps that government hasn't thought about, uh, that we may be able to incorporate in. So we want to ensure that we have that opportunity to work in a collaborative manner to discuss these metrics and, uh, and move forward together. We're going to move to the, I have someone on the phone. Uh, operator, can you please put uh, through the first caller? First question is from Jeremy Appel with Medicine Hat News. Jeremy, your line is open. Hi. Um I think that there's a certain uh, perception that some uh, fields of study are more um, oriented towards, um, you know, uh, better economic outcomes than others. H how is this not an attack on the arts and humanities? Uh, no, far from it. Um, there's more so today, I would argue, that the requirement from employers and from industry and the economy to find graduates and find employers who have sharp critical thinking skills and excellent creative skills is growing in demand. Uh, there's there's a, a huge movement, as we know. There's, there's growing technological change in our society. A recent report by the Conference Board of Canada suggested that here in Alberta, a, a vast majority of current professions would be disrupted by automation or by technological advancements in some way or another. And so the demand for our graduates to have critical thinking skills, be very adaptable and flexible, is growing in importance. And so uh, this model will, will help to ensure that as we're focused on developing graduates and individuals who are job ready, we have to keep in mind those, uh, that skill set in terms of critical thinking, and uh, those are important skill set that one learns primarily through 
uh, liberal arts programming. And as I mentioned, it appears as though those, that skill set is growing in demand. And so it's important for us to ensure that we are not just looking at it from an employment perspective, but from a skill set uh, skill set perspective as well. Uh, now, what happens if one of these institutions decides uh, that they want to dispute one of the criteria? Can they do that? Is there already a process set up? So again, we'll, we'll be engaging in a round of uh, consultation with our institutions uh, to give them some more clarity about the specific metrics that we as government are thinking about. And we'll have some opportunity to sit down and discuss those uh, with each individual institution. Uh, and at the end of the day, government will, will finalize those metrics after we've gone through a period of further discussion and, uh, and move forward together. So if the institution uh, during those consultations says, hey, uh, we don't agree with this criteria for this reason, whatever, are you able to overrule them, or do they have the option to say to you, uh, you know, can we just take another look at it and maybe go through with another set of criteria? So, so government will, will set the system-wide metrics that we will be using, but as I said, uh, I want to ensure that uh, everybody has an opportunity to provide feedback, suggest new metrics, uh, and to help inform government's decisions there. And for clarification, sorry if you mentioned this, but uh, will they all be different? Per institution, or is it sort of uh, similar, if not the same, across the board? Yeah, the metrics will be similar, if, if not uh, the same across the board. We will have some standard system-wide metrics. However, the, the way we weight those metrics will, may vary. Um, quite a bit from one institution to, the, uh, to another. Uh, let's, let's look at an example. If we say international student enrollment and we establish that as a target and we want to work with our institutions to increase international students, some of our institutions have a much better ability to achieve that goal than others. And so it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be effective to establish the same benchmark for international students to say that every institution must have 10% international students uh, some simply don't have the, the ability or doesn't, doesn't work with their, their geographic service area or the nature of their academic programming. So it's important that we, we weight the metrics uh, specific to each individual institution. The, the entire uh, point behind the exercise, as I mentioned already, is to recognize that each one of our post-secondary institutions is unique and we want to create a system in which there, we're able to reflect that individual nature and character of our post-secondary institutions while moving forward to achieve better outcomes. Are you concerned at all that this system could see, you know, smaller institutions uh, struggle a little bit to, you know, keep up with that as, you know, lots of them consider themselves a, a place that is education for all, you know, that, you know, doesn't matter how well you did in a certain program, like, we can educate you here. Are Correct. you worried that that you know, could impact a lot of Albertans who might not be able to attend post-secondary otherwise? Uh, I'm not, and uh, primarily for the reason, as, as I just outlined, that um, we would sit down with each individual institution and uh, decide on how each target and each metric should be weighted. And so I, I would be more concerned if we opted, and which is why I, I didn't choose to go in this direction, a more system-wide and competitive system to say that every institution must achieve, you know, a graduation rate of, of 70 percent. Uh, I didn't believe that that type of a framework would work uh, because, as I mentioned, each one of our institutions is, is unique. There are different learner needs, different demands. I mean, I'll give you another example. Northern Lakes College, for example, their mandate is to provide academic programming to a geographic area that's the size of a third of the province. So their targets and the way those targets are going to be weighted need to be quite different because their priority and their mandate is to ensure that individuals in some of the most remote parts of our province have access to post-secondary programming. So uh, that would be an important priority that we would be looking at, which of course reflects their own mandate, their own mission, and something that we as government would like to see. So because we've created a system in which we can individually develop uh, targets and set individual agreements, uh, I believe it won't disadvantage any of our institutions. Are you going to be assessing institutions just as a whole, or will you be breaking it down by department or by program in any way, is it, or is it just the institution? No, it'll be the institution as a whole. We will be evaluating the institution as a whole uh, uh, as it relates to their performance as success against the individual targets. Uh, that, that success will be measured annually. 
and uh, it won't be done on a, on a specific program or faculty basis. It'll be, we'll be looking at the institution as a whole. How does that work for institutions, very large ones like the U of A or the U of C, where they have, um, you know, they might have programs that are, that are very much geared toward a specific career, like law or medicine, and then they have liberal arts or they have science degrees. Um, how, how do you kind of deal with that? Yeah, well, the, um, a, a lot of our institutions already measure and benchmark themselves against a lot of the, the metrics that I've outlined, you know, whether it's student satisfaction, completion rates, graduation rates. Uh, they already have a lot of that data themselves and already evaluate themselves against that. And so I, I, I truly believe that this won't be uh, an unnecessary burden on our institutions to, you know, gather a lot of new data and collect a lot of new information. They already have a lot of those numbers, and each institution has uh, 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 institution-wide uh, figures as it relates to graduation and completion rates. So we'd be able to look at that from an institution perspective and, uh, and discuss whether or not that, that target can be improved or whether it should remain the same. We have time for one more question. And, and I should add, uh, sorry, just, just on that point before we get to the last question, um, that uh, within, within each target, within each metric, there'll be a, a threshold tolerance, if you will. So if we established, uh, and I'm just using a number here, a benchmark of 75% completion rate for Medicine Hat College, and they got to 74.9, that they wouldn't that wouldn't be counted as not coming into 100%. We would establish threshold tolerances around each of the targets. Does the government anticipate saving money from this? I, I just, in terms of the changes that we've seen in post-secondary lifting the tuition cap, are you anticipating that if, if a school does not make its targets and it's only getting 90% of the funding it expected that that funding, they would have to make it up by raising tuition? Uh, well, the, the the fundamental decision on tuition, of course, is one that's uh, with, one that's in the hands of every individual institution. Um, there may, of course, be a situation in which an institution doesn't meet all of its targets, and there would be there would be savings there. Uh, and I believe that that's an area where we need to have some continued discussions about how whether whether those those savings should be reinvested back into the system, be provided as a reward to an institution who uh, perhaps exceeded their targets. Uh, and so there, there is indeed a possibility that there, there are uh, that an institution doesn't meet all their targets, that they don't receive that full funding envelope, and, uh, and we need to discuss uh, what next steps look like from there. Do you have a dollar figure though for every year you might anticipate saving X amount because of this new system? We we don't. Uh, there's we we need to of course have that round of discussion and consultation with our post secondary stakeholders to figure out and discuss uh, how we're going to weight the individual metrics and the metrics uh, and what those final metrics will look like. And once all of those pieces are in place, we might have a, a, a better picture at that point. But are you worried this might affect attracting faculty at all? Because uh, if funding is unsure all the time, um, how are they? How are faculty supposed to plan for staffing? So people who, you know, it's hard to get on tenure anyway, now this seems a little more precarious. Well, I, I, I wouldn't call it precarious. The, uh, you know, as we mentioned, the, the maximum uh, envelope of, of uh, at-risk funding, uh, performance-based funding, is, is 40%. So the vast majority of funding is, is guaranteed through the three-year IMAs. We'll be able to provide our institutions more predictability uh, as well over the next three years about what they can expect. And I believe that that kind of predictability and certainty over a multi-year period, again, as, as illustrated by some of the examples that I provided, is something that many jurisdictions around the world are already doing and they're attracting high quality talent and uh, i believe there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from there well thank you all very much for coming